Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics and in this video we're answering questions again. So this is actually more a comment, but I thought it was worth uh, reading it and then kind of talking about this. So it says, um, great video, thank you. I'm running Dirac Art and I'm getting very good results. I look forward to learning more about art as it has so much potential. Over the years, I found myself getting better and better results with Direct Live with bass control and I think we'll see the same with art. When installers and users become more familiar and experienced with art, and on top of that, Dirac will release better versions of it. And so I think that is all true, and it's an important thing to understand right now. When these new codecs get released, these new, it's not really a codec, this new, these new algorithms for correction get released, um, they're not perfect. You know, they go through beta testing, and they go through a lot of internal testing, and they do a lot of work to try to make them as good as possible, but... There is always this, I think anybody, I've said this before, I believe, anyone who's ever done any kind of an engineering project knows that you don't release a perfect product. That doesn't happen. What you do is you hit a certain point where you say, it's good enough, we've hit the targets we set for the product, and we need to get something out so that there can start to be a return on that investment. But I think inevitably you always see situations where maybe due to uh, budget, maybe due to time, so resource issues, uh, you have to not do something you know would make it better. Um, I think there's other times where you'll get into something and as you're exploring these engineering options, you'll actually find problems that you know you can fix, but you haven't figured out how to fix them yet. And so um, what happens is you look at it and say, well, it's good enough. Like we can release it and people are going to get benefit from it. But it could be better. We just have to overcome some of these issues and that'll happen in time. And in fact, maybe getting user feedback will help us resolve the solution to that. So when Direct Art was first being explored for home use, it went by a different name, and I was familiar with the product. It was used in Volvos, actually, were the first uh, vehicles to get it, and it was used in cars. So here was the thing about a car environment that made this approach, which is a multi and multi out, a MIMO type correction approach, make sense. In a car, the speaker positions are fixed and set by the engineers. They're optimized within the constraints of a car environment. The speaker drivers themselves are selected for their purpose and are custom engineered. The amplifiers are custom made. The DSP that controls it is all custom done for its purpose, for what they're trying to do. And the dynamic capabilities of those speakers is well known by the engineering staff. And that allows you to use a multi-in, multi-out approach very, very effectively because all of those uh, limitations are understood at the outset and they're accounted for in the way that it works. For those who don't understand what, what uh, direct art is and what makes it unique, with the exception of waveforming and basically looking at it more historically, all the common correction systems that are on the market right now use one of two approaches, but they're all single out approaches, meaning whether you use multiple measurement positions or a single measurement position, you're always correcting for one speaker and that's it you're not using another speaker to correct for that one speaker. You're not actively doing something to the reflections in the room that screw up that response. So in a room, we have a multitude of problems. One of the problems is actually the speaker itself. Very few, if any, speakers are perfect, and there are ways to make them better. So it's actually in and of itself a bit of a mixed phase problem too. We often think of speakers as being um, a minimum phase only, and that's generally true, but there are some issues with the speakers that can be corrected using uh, non-minimum phase corrections. FIR filters are often used to ensure that we get a, a clean phase response, good time alignment, and a flat frequency response, which don't necessarily all go together. Uh, in a perfect, proper speaker, yes, that would be true, but that's rarely true. So one of the things we actually need to do is correct the speaker itself, unrelated to the room. So you want the speaker to be acting like a coherent source, a pulsing sphere is the kind of classic argument. And to do that, in order to really act that way, there are some things you can do with FIR filters to correct the impulse response. Then there's the frequency response. Now, many speakers today are pretty well engineered and have a good frequency response, but not all of them. And so there's little corrections that can be made to the uh, listening window response. And uh, a microphone can pick that up in a room, but it's hard to separate that from the room itself. So there's some tricks we do in the correction algorithm where it looks at basically what's direct and what's reflected. 
Then we've got stuff going on with the room that creates these definitively not minimum phase problems. These are absolutely a mix of minimum phase and non-minimum phase. So we call this a mixed phase situation at this point. And those are caused often by reflections. And so we have to use a mixture of FIR correction and IIR correction. IIR, for, for those not familiar with the difference between the two, are your standard PEQ, your graphic EQs, that kind of a stuff. So PEQ filters are great for addressing a lot of problems in a room because a lot of them are minimum phase. Anything that's not minimum phase cannot be corrected with a uh, IR filter. And so what you have to do is use an FIR filter, which has this advantage. You can separate the amplitude response from the phase response correction, and for that matter, timing stuff. And so you can go into the, the problem case, if you will, and you can look at what's going on and you can correct these things independently, which allows you to correct for some of the errors caused by these reflections. But you need to be careful because the brain doesn't interpret the reflections the same way it necessarily is, is detecting the direct sound. So you need to understand this is the psychoacoustics part, how we hear it. You don't want to necessarily correct all of that. And you need to be able to sample the room in such a way that the algorithm has the data it needs to make these kind of decisions. And doing that requires multiple positions. There's also the fact that, and I wrote a whole article on this once, the, the ears don't pick up sound the same way that microphones do. So if you do a single microphone right here between where my ears are, the frequency response isn't going to match what you hear. And if you were to correct for that, you could create problems that are actually not good sounding, but would look good on a microphone. Now, one of the things you can do is you can add additional microphone positions. And even if the only thing we care about is right here, you know, this is where I'm going to always be and I don't care about anybody else. I want to optimize it for me. You still don't want one microphone position. So those systems were known as CISO systems. There was a move to the multi-mic systems, which was a CMO system. So it's, um, sorry, I said that wrong. It's a um, MISO system, multiple in, multiple measurement positions, single out. We're still correcting only for one speaker. And... Um, those systems allowed us to re resolve a lot of the problems and what we heard in, a, in sound, but there were a couple of areas where it doesn't work that well. So at mid-high frequencies, especially the higher up frequencies, the reflections in the room, the brain does a really good job filtering those out, and they actually just become a part of how we perceive spaciousness and envelopment, but the effect they have on frequency response is not particularly, it, it's benign, it's not a particularly big issue. And so we don't really need to worry about that. As you get lower in frequency, what happens is that there's this integration time where the brain has to take for a given wavelength um, all the sound energy it's hearing and do something with it. And when the wavelengths get large relative to the room boundaries, you get so many reflections that by the time the brain has perceived tone at that frequency, the reflections are an intrinsic part of what you hear. So what that means is that those reflections are not filtered by the brain and they are affecting our perception of tone. So the timbre is changing as a result of that. And this tends to happen in two areas. One very distinctly, the modal region, and one we kind of call the transition zone. It, it, it kind of we do. So there's this point um, between the modal region and the stochastic region that we divide, that we refer to as the, the frequency cutoff, uh, the Schroeder frequency. But actually there's this range between that Schroeder frequency, which is more of a distinct cutoff between discrete modes and where we start to enter into stuff that isn't, that there's a lot of overlap. But there's this actually, it's not like a hard cutoff. There's actually a point between that and up arbitrarily higher where you, there are discrete modes, but there's also overlap. And there's, so there's kind of signs of stochastic behavior and there's signs of modal behavior. And so we call that the uh, transition zone, sort of a mixed zone. And in that zone, you also have issues where those reflections are clearly affecting our perception of tone. So the best way to fix it would be to address those reflections which are not helping us with perceiving spaciousness and development in good ways. They're not helping us to make everything sound bigger and more real. In fact, all they're doing is coloring the sound in bad ways. Effectively, it would be modes, SBIR effects, things like that. And get rid of those reflections. Now, you could put tons of fuzz all over the room, but it actually would be extremely difficult to do that effectively enough to get good results. And you're gonna absorb a lot of the other stuff that you wanna keep. So the really cool thing is you can actively do it. You can use speakers to actively remove reflections by sending them a special signal. Now, in its simplistic, most simplistic form, I should say, if you think about it, if you take the sound that's coming from a speaker and it's heading towards a wall and you time a signal that inverts the phase, 
and then delayed by the amount of the path length between the two, then when that sound wave hits that wall where the speaker is, the sound coming from that speaker will cancel it out. Because everybody understands, I'm sure, that if you take one speaker, for instance, and you have it play pink noise, and you take another speaker, and you invert the pink noise, but it's playing the same pink noise, just an opposite phase, and you put them right face to face, you will hear virtually nothing. And in fact, if you could do it in such a way that they're hitting each other fully coherently but out of phase, you would it would be nothing. You would, you would hear nothing at all. Perfect cancellation. Same concept. Think of it like noise canceling in a way. So... The, the trick is that you can't actually do it that way. That's, it, would, it would not yield good results. You would get a lot of problems in the room if you did that. So what you do is you send specially filtered and processed signals with all the delay and phase change needed to correct specifically the problems you're trying to target, but leave everything else intact and avoid creating artifacts. So waveforming took an approach, I've talked about this before, where I basically said, rather than trying to get rid of all the complex reflections in a room, we're going to not create them in the first place on as many walls as possible. And that was the idea behind the planner array. And then we're only going to have to deal with one reflection, the back wall reflection, and that is much easier to deal with and it reduces any chance of creating artifacts. Dirac Art took a more practical approach and said, well, but a lot of people are not going to be able to do that probably. And like I said, in this car environment approach where the product started out, it was understood that there was a way to do this which had very little artifacts and yielded really good results where we could get rid of those reflections and create really, really clean, good bass up to pretty high frequencies. I mean, I think they've done testing all the way up to like five kilohertz. You could easily go up to 500 hertz. It doesn't currently do that, but the software has the capacity to do that without issue. It's just that as you get higher in frequency, getting the speakers in the right locations and having everything work just so becomes so critical to avoid those artifacts I was mentioning. And the artifacts would be best described as basically tone that doesn't cancel that you hear. So imagine portions of the signal that are coming out and they're not canceling and you're hearing them. That shouldn't be there. You're going to hear that as like extra reverb in a sense and it's not going to sound good. So when the product first came out, one of my big concerns with how they're going to release this in a home residential version was that none of that stuff is known. Like, you don't know the size of the room. You don't know the location of the speakers. You don't know the dynamic capabilities of the speakers. You don't know the bandwidth of the speakers. How are they going to create this dual algorithm that's going to be able to account for that? And I raised it with them, and they actually said, no, you're right. That is a concern that we need to overcome. When the product was ready, ready to release, I remember being a little surprised because I hadn't yet heard of a solution from them on this. But I got excited because it has a ton of potential. And so I did a video on it, and I've, I've told this story before. They actually contacted me right afterwards and they said, great video, we love it. You, we are shocked at how much of this you understood and have released a ton of information on this. So let's have a conversation internally and coordinate a little bit so that as information leaks out from people like me, it's in line with what they're doing. Because I actually didn't know that much. All I knew was the white paper and other implementations. I didn't know what they were doing for this residential one. So we had some conversations. I did some more talks and videos on it. And I, of course, I've shared that with all of you. And one of the things I learned was that the way that they resolved that dynamic issue was that they put some limitations on what it can do. And they also give you the option to select basically how capable the speaker is, which affects what it does. In the measurements, it's able to get a sense of the speaker's bandwidth. It cannot get a sense of its dynamic range, so you have to manually set that. And so there still are possibilities for problems, but they've made it better than it is. However, it still doesn't know where the speakers are. It can get a semblance of that, but it really can't know exactly where they are. And it, you know, They don't use a 3D mic. That would be an interesting way to advance this, but they're not there yet. And so I was curious how well it was going to work, but I was very excited and I got a lot of assurances that it, they had done a lot of testing and everything was good. They gave me the beta software. I was only able to do very limited testing with the beta software. It seemed promising. And then it came out on the Storm processors. And I'll just be very honest, I was very disappointed. I But the thing was, I could see the potential. I saw what it was doing and it was doing some things really well. But the problem I was having were a number of things. So one of the ways I saw it was Gene DeLaSalle's own system. And his system is very unusual. I think a lot of people don't look at it and see it as very unusual. But when you think of it from the standpoint of standard, full range speakers, and then typical home theater based management, you quickly recognize how it's doing things that are not normal because basically it's got uh, subwoofers attached to the speakers as part of the tower design. And 
um, ARC just wasn't designed for that. And so there's high pass filters in the system for the mains that are undesirable for Gene, and it creates some limitations. The other part of the problem that was coming up was those artifact issues we mentioned. Gene was hearing the artifacts, and then when I got to hear it, I heard some of the artifacts too. And I then had heard some other demos of it um, in setup systems where I, again, was hearing some of these artifacts. And we were starting to get a sense of what was causing them and where they were coming from and what to do to fix it. And so you could minimize them more, but it seemed like the best fix would have been a more optimized layout. And so I talked again with the team at Dirac about this, and we had, a, it was probably an hour and a half conversation about all of this. And, and the conclusion I drew from that was that I think that the algorithm needed and probably still needs some work to get it to a point where it can account for a wider range of systems and fully optimize results. The potential is there, and it can already do very good things for a lot of systems. So when I say the potential is there, it's not like I think of it as it's terrible and you shouldn't use it until they fix it. It's more that in certain systems, it may make things worse rather than better. And those systems are what I call fringe case systems. Jeans is a good example of that, where again, he's got full range speakers with subwoofers that are out from the wall, creating complex issues to deal with, and it just is struggling with that. And then there's certain things he wants and needs out of it that it's not able to do. I think the fixes are very simple. They've actually already told us that they're going to work on implementing fixes to make this all work better. But they've also started to implement some changes to the algorithm to fix some of the artifacts that people were noticing and some of the other issues. And then we as, as integrator calibrators are starting to get better at where to put the microphones to get everything to work just so. And I've had enough conversations with them to understand that part of their view is it just needs to get used more to understand better. Sim you can do simulations to your blue in the face, but they don't always tell you everything about every situation. For one thing, we don't always know how the speakers that people are using will behave in their room in these simulations. It doesn't mean the simulations are bad or wrong. It's just that we have to make assumptions in the simulations and they may not match reality. So you guys will go out and try something. It doesn't work. And then you look at why and you're like, oh, I never would have thought that there's a speaker on the market that would act that way or do that. So we didn't include that in the simulation. You then take that into account and realize, hey, it's a relatively easy fix. You can implement that in the next version of Dirac and everything's good. So they are making changes pretty constantly and it seems to be getting better and better, which is great. I am curious to see how it's going to work in future lower end home theater processors. Storm is extremely flexible and it allows you to overcome some issues with that flexibility. You can also cause issues because of that flexibility if you don't know what you're doing. That's a common issue. Um, and when you get over to something like a Moran's processor or an Anthem doesn't use it, but let's say like an Anthem processor or an Arcan processor or something else that doesn't have that level of flexibility and capability in its routing and base management, I then kind of wonder like what's going to happen when you start to put uh, something like Direct Art into the correction scheme. One thing I would like to try with it, and I haven't had an opportunity to do this yet, so hopefully in the future I can, would be to use something that's a bit of a hybrid between what's going on with waveforming and the common way people have been using art, where you don't try to use the surround speakers as your bass control speakers. You actually use dedicated bass modules in similar locations around the room. Another thing that I'd be very curious to try would be, what if you just did a bass array in the front and a pair of subwoofers mid-wall in the back? So, uh, you know, it may be able to do a lot with that, like enough that that would be a better approach. I'm really curious to try it. Or maybe you could do something where that's your main base control and then the side surrounds are something kind of, they're still used, but maybe more minimally. But I think that from like a design standpoint, it does change fundamentally what kind of speakers people should be putting in their walls. If you know you want to do art, for instance, you should think for sure about the bandwidth and output of those speakers for every channel, including your, your tops potentially. Like I would, it's just because I use them a lot, let's just talk about Prolisten. If you were going to do a system where you were going to use the R series because you're wanting to go save a little bit of money and get good performance here, using R5Is for the left, center, and right, and you were going to use R4Is for the surround, I might say, no, I think you should use R5Is for your surrounds because that's going to give them a lot more bandwidth. The other thing, though, would be to say maybe the R5I isn't the right speaker for this because the small in-wall enclosure is going to limit the bass capabilities quite a bit. And if you need more bass output, you might want to look at something else. Maybe not an in-wall, maybe an on-wall speaker, or maybe a different kind of in-wall with more bass output. 
it doesn't mean that Perlison wouldn't work good. It would be a very good speaker in this scenario. It just wouldn't be necessarily the best choice. You'd have to redesign it a little bit. Um, a lot of processors will not have enough channels to do some of the best ways to implement this. Like I was saying, like doing some base augmentation speakers that are just used for base control that you would use along with the surrounds. Let's just say you did a system that was like 11.1.6, and then you had, let's say, two independent base channels in the front. So we're at, what is that, uh, 17, 19 channels. You could potentially need, though, let's see, two on, probably on the left side, two on the right side, and two in the back. So that's six more. What were we up at? 90. So we're at like 25 channels. And then you might need some in the ceiling. Like that might actually help in some ways. So you you'll, you could see yourself quickly running out of channels. And that's just assuming you're doing something like that. What if you had an even higher channel count? We've got systems where we're we're at like 27 channels, not including subwoofers, you know? So like you'll quickly exceed the 32 that most of these processors max out at. And 32 is the max that ARC can do right now. So... Uh, so there's another one direct, by the way. I think you guys should start thinking about 48 and 68, uh, 64 channels. All right, anyway, so I agree with that comment. Direct R holds a lot of promise, and I think that as we see improvements with it going forward, it's going to be more capable and something that all uh, you all should look at. And the same can be said about waveforming. They already are, are, before it even ever got released to the public, but during the beta phase, they actually added significant capabilities to it to allow you to have more flexible. They now have a system where you can just have an array of subwoofers on the floor, which you couldn't do before, and, and uh, it yields very good results. And now it becomes one of those, well, how good of a result do you want? Because that will affect which subwoofer array you use, but you no longer have to use these difficult array approaches. And in time, there's going to be even more capabilities added to it. So both of these are going to be uh, becoming better and better and better. On top of that, I strongly suspect that you will see very smart people like the guys at Trinob and Dirac start to implement similar multi and multi out type approaches in other methods of room correction. So there is nobody else that I know of that has anything like that as of today. But I think you're going to start to see other companies implement something similar over time. And all of this is very, very exciting because it enhances the base in ways that are just hard to describe. But it is significantly better than traditional approaches. Anyway, I hope you found that uh, interesting and uh, you enjoyed the video. I know I talk about this a lot, but I think it is an important and valuable discussion to keep having. So we'll call this just a general overview of direct art and to a point waveforming and the continued improvements we're going to see over time. Um, subscribe to my channel. I appreciate that. All of the, um, the little extra money you guys send me helps to produce these videos. Uh, there is some cost, including time to this. And uh, I like doing them, but I do sometimes have to weigh doing the videos versus other stuff. So when you guys throw in some money, it just helps me to feel confident that this is a good way to use some of my time. So thanks again, everybody. I appreciate the support and keep on watching.